Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of What's Next Live, where really I have the humble, humble honor of welcoming Mr. Ram Sharan to my show today. Welcome, Mr. Sharan. Wait, he asked me to call him Ram, so I'll do my best. Welcome, Ram, to the show. Thank you. I'm honored to be on your show. I love to share anything you would like to know, and it's my honor to be here. I am very grateful to you. Oh, and I am so grateful to you as well. So if you're not familiar with who uh, Ram Sharan is, he's a world-renowned business consultant, author, and speaker who spent the past 40 years working with top company CEOs and uh, boards. He has authored more than 33 books um, since 1998 that have sold over 4 million copies in a dozen languages. He travels the world. He visits executives at their homes to see how they live and work to really help advise them for the future of business and work, but he's also super passionate about a new book he has out called Talent, which we will talk about in a few minutes. Um, but I wanna start this conversation with a little story. It was all the way back in 2003, um, I was working for a CEO uh, named Joel Coher and uh, he handed me this book called Execution. And he wrote inside of it, you know, you can do all kinds of things in business, but the basic premise of it was unless you can execute, it just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I've now read this book uh, over the past 20 years, probably a dozen times. It is a must read go to if you are looking to uh, execute in your business. Um, but I think I'm going to start there, Ram, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, one on really the basis of the discipline of getting things done, because I think right now there's so mm -hmm. much to get done that people lose sight of how do you actually uh, make those decisions and execute on the things that are going to have the greatest impact to your business. So maybe you yeah. could share a little bit of that. Yeah. So first thing, Tiffany, is that execution creates growth. People don't understand that. The reason is twofold. One, when you execute well, your customer welcomes you. And second, when you execute well, it gives you energy to do more. And that's a fundamental premise. 80% of our time plus is an execution. 20% is finding good ideas, creating strategies, thinking about the right kind of high quality decisions. Now, when it comes to the execution, discipline of getting things done, there are very important items like the athletes prepare for Olympics and their discipline and their, their practice, their determination to do that. In the corporations, there are fundamental rules. Number one is clear accountability. Transparency of accountability. We have shared matrices, convoluted organization structures, but we don't have clear accountabilities. Today, using the AI, we now have clear accountabilities, total transparencies. And that is why Amazon does so well. Number two, you have vision, you have a strategy, but you can't win without priorities. What are the dominant priorities? And this is a tough job to have the right priorities they are not some phony high-level priorities. They are very specific priorities. You take the automobile industry today. Every old company is going to change. We do not know what will happen 10 years out. But you have to make some decisions today. What are your priorities? How clear are you? You cannot obfuscate. If you do, your execution will be lousy. We may hate Elon Musk, you may hate his behavior, but his priorities are totally clear. And he has a discipline to deliver those numbers of the cars. It ha does happen and changing the whole industry. So priorities from goals. Then the next one, the priorities that everybody's missing and what made Larry Bassidy so good and my co-author is that those priorities and we bought, I borrowed this from from Steve Jobs, what he called DRI, Directly Responsible Individual. Each priority has a directly responsible individual. 
is transparent. That individual does not have full authority, but he or she drives it to the organization. And if there are hurdles and problems, either they resolve or they go upstairs within 24 hours and you pick up speed. And the last one is the KPIs, key performance indicators and incentives. Now, in most companies, they are creating rigidities. Mm -hmm. They are not adaptable to the changes on the outside. Use of AI is now permitting that. Now, you know, there was a time, and I believe it is happening, Walmart adjusted prices every hour on a number of items. We consumer face that. I go to the hotels. Same hotel two weeks ago, I paid $300. Today, they're telling me $700. <laughs> so these are the things. The people need to be rewarded more also on the getting things done. At the same time, if they don't meet the goal of that execution, you don't automatically punish them. You got to investigate what is the cause. So in Amazon, they meet every two weeks. There is somebody assigned for each major matrix. Matrix, And if there is a problem, they actually assign a person to work backwards to see the whole process, what needs to change. So execution creates wealth. It creates energy. It creates growth. In the execution book, we put some very practical things. And those who have not followed in large companies, they are having great problems of satisfying shareholders because they don't go through the athletic discipline the way we go for Olympics. So the book has those three mechanisms of people, operations, and strategy. You work it every year with discipline. You become natural to it. You build a rhythm to it. And then people synchronize like a clockwork. That's what Mr. Bassetti did, Jack Welsh did. And then Dave Cote, who succeeded Honey in Honeywell, he did it. And he took a company from $28 a share over 193 in a 10-year period. Doing the same execution in a very, very big way and succeeding. Well, I want to make sure I share a little love for you, Ram. We got a comment here from Mark saying, execution he wrote with Larry Bosity. I actually turned around a failing operation after reading that book. So Fantastic. Congratulations, Mark. Good to hear from you. So, you know, ultimately, I would say that it sounds simple at its core, right? You read the book and you're like, it's almost obvious. It's almost yes. And I find the disconnect between the intellectual understanding of those things you need to do, right? Accountability, priorities, DRI, KPIs, the things you just walk through, and then stepping into the actual doing of it. Yeah, exactly. And there, one more thing, Tiffany. The key part is, do you have the right DRI? Do you have the right person executing it? You destroy people by wrong people being assigned. It's not just the company suffer, the people suffer. And so you as a leader got to know your people. You get to know your raw material. You get to know your business. You got to know your people and say, what is their God's gift? And we got to match that. In Olympics, you don't put a swimmer into some other sport. In, 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 in any sport, you don't put a picture to do something different. So here is a very important item of execution to put the people in the right jobs or to structure the job so the person flourish because there, there is nothing more motivating than a human being experiencing success. Absolutely. And there's nothing, I would say, more demotivating than, a, than the wrong person in that DRI role. Absolutely. And people around that person. Because the toxicity comes when you have the wrong person and then the people around that person also get the negative impact 
of that behavior. So well, I, have placed, I have placed a huge emphasis with big, big, big companies. I do this now almost daily with the CEOs. Is this person right for this job? And then I say, is this job right for the person? Right. Now changing that language is influencing them. Well, and you might say that person was right for the job two years ago and might not be right for the job today because the market <laughs> has shifted and things have changed, correct? Correct. So what I'm doing with them, you know, I have some of the largest companies in India and so on. I'm saying it's your responsibility today to look down, let us say, two years. And look at each of your people. And then ask, what does it take for this person to be very effective two years out to take us in the future? Teach them. Write it down, what they've got to develop. Give them the freedom. And so go and develop, because we think, unless you do those two things, you will be obsolete. Well, and, and I think that's a great segue to your new uh, to your new book, Talent. Uh, if yes. you haven't gone out to get this, I think it's coming up for uh, sale. This is an advanced copy, um, and then this is the the actual copy. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the market cap multiplier, which I yep. think is a bold statement, that talent is the market cap multiplier. Right. Why do you think people don't maybe leaders maybe either don't understand that? number one, or they don't actually leverage it to its full capacity, number two. Yeah, it's a very insightful question, Tiffany. I want to mention to you this. Everybody knows this. I was involved in bringing Steve Jobs back. He was a market cap multiplier, single-handedly. Everybody knows that. We have many more of these people. So this book came from General Atlantic. They have 125 companies. And they recruited a gentleman named Anish Bartlow, my lead co-author. And his total number of people is eight. And he got the job to take each of these companies coming and say the reason General Atlantic and any private equity acquires a company, they acquire because they invest money to get a multiplier of that money at the end of the day. That's their intent. So they look at the market, segment, competition, growth, technology, and say this is a good deal. It makes sense about the industry and so on. But execution of that is a real issue. So in the execution, there are four steps that this gentleman developed. And we're saying that this is the company who put $100 million in it. We think the market is right, customer is right, competitive advantage is right. And if everything goes right, it should return maybe 400 million in five years. So they put in 100 million? Is that what you just said? They put in Correct. 100? Okay. Yeah. And they make an estimate that if we execute right, it should give us 500 million in four years or 400 million in five years. It's very clear. And then they will write what do we have to do, what we need to do over a five-year period that will get us. So what do you have to do is a new product development of a different kind, a more different kind of a channel or different kind of advertising or some mixture or a different kind of a technology have to be brought in. So this is the business priorities. So now we have item number one, what is our goal? four times the market value. Now, what are the priorities? A different segment, a larger introduction of new products with a new technology, or different advertising on multiple channels, very clearly laid out. Now, in this talent side of it, then Anish Bartlo and his team go into the company and do interviews of many, many people and they have 200 pages of notes. This is the most in-depth diagnosis. Like the, we do MRI in health, this is not one hour interviews. Right. Interviews involve what you like, what you don't like, how are you working, how do you see the business as a whole, where is this business going to go? And they all talk about it, it all comes out. 
And then they spend weeks to look at those 200 pages. It's all handwritten, it's detailed. Two to three people look at it and they diagnose how this top organization is going to deliver that goal. And out of that, they assess. So if you have a, 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 a need for acquiring customers, so they have a slot called customer acquisition. So they look at who can do the best. Now they're finding out that in the last six months before they acquire, this company was not acquiring enough of the customers. So they're going to search the world out to find the person who will create the customer acquisitions maybe five times than what you have. They will show to the CEO. CEO will make the decision, the board will make a decision. So they go to each of these jobs and say, when the fifth year come, are you ready to go to the next level at a higher scale? So they search people who have got a large scale experience. They're directly linked to what the job demands. They will propose a change in organization structure, KPIs, and the operating rhythms going at it. There are times when they find that the CEO is really no longer adequate. They show them, they work together, and they say, no, you stay in certain ways because you found it, you have technology, you have relationship, but we need the person who will take it to that level. Having said that, there are two things that are different. And only, as far as I could figure out, Amazon has a version of it. And that's why its success is so fast. And that is, we will give you very reasonable fixed salary every year. And then, in most cases, no annual bonus. You will collect at the end of five years a huge fallout. If you did not meet your quarterly numbers, it's okay. So long we find the reasons for it and you correct it. But you've got to catch up to deliver those. It's a totally different psychology. Now, it is different from public companies where they have 10% to 20% maximum fix, 80 to 90% variable. And that doesn't work for creating market value. So Bezos has that. Bezos has a market value you fix, and then they will allocate the number of shares. It will be evaluated in four years, in or out. And if you stay four years and done your things, you get a big windfall of those shares because the shares continue to go, have, have continued to go into last year very high. So here, this is what is why market cap multiplier. We start from the very beginning, we put 100 million and we've got to get minimum 400 million, maximum in five years unless there was a special reason for something. And then we say to do that, what are the business priorities? And then we say, right people, right operating model, right incentives, and a different kind of a compensation system. And people love it because the anxiety of quarterly gone. They deliver the numbers, no doubt. But just like in Bezos in Amazon, every two weeks, a metric is not met. Find the causes. They're not finding the person unless it's a code of conduct issue. Well, so let me ask you, the that was a beautiful waterfall of sort of getting to the basis of this multiplier effect. Yeah. A, a, especially at the C-suite. Yeah. Especially in large organization. No, this was a small. Go ahead. But oh, I was using Amazon. Sorry, I was using oh, yeah, Amazon. Sure, go ahead. Yes, yeah, please, yeah. you do. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, that if you're an individual contributor or a, or a manager of a small team, mm. finding this multiplier, mm. you know, in your talent mm. is, could you do the same thing? Like, what is our team going? Oh, yes, yes, what yes, are, yes. What are the priorities, right? Yeah, you see, see, my eldest brother's granddaughter just about a year ago joined on her own Amazon. And guess what? She can't believe it. She got X number of shares day one and she's a low level person 
she's a digital person. Now she's trained from day one. What are your priorities? How are you working with your collaboration? And they're watching her going in. So what, I think the thing in there that's critical is consistency. No doubt. Like, what are the vi what is the vision? Sort of what is the values? You know. But I would say that whenever I am just going to speak about myself, you use a Steve Jobs or a Jeff Bezos example, or even the CEO where I work, Mark Benioff at Salesforce. You use those examples, and you you, you might say they're 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 the unicorns in leadership, right? Kind of a thing. And you may have leaders who want to be better, you know, like they don't do any of these things or I'm a manager and I don't do any of these things. I have to start somewhere. Exactly. Where exactly. would you say the best place to start is in that situation? Yeah. See, if you are in, if you mean individual contributor. Yes. You, or, or, a team manager, or a team manager, right? I'm no, a first time manager. No. Yep. Very first thing. Yep. Be extremely clear what the goal is. And the keyword is extremely clear. No obfuscation. Without the goal, you don't go anywhere. You cannot team anywhere. Right. The Olympics yeah. people, teams are very clear. Rowing is very clear. Clarity is worth 10,000 points IQ. We don't teach that. And when I recruit CEOs, I test that. I say, if you're not a clear thinker, you won't survive. Second is then looking at what kind of things to be done to achieve that goal. This is separate from execution. I need to create a joint venture with somebody. That is a thing to do, task to do. I use the word COT critical operating tasks. What are they? I have a rule from Steve Jobs. Three of them will account for 80% of the impact. Find those three. Now you go into execution. Do you have the right balance of the team? Do you know each of them? What ticks them? Do you know how they work together? Do you know how to facilitate a team dialogue? Team dialogue is a skill, for example, I'm exposed to a gentleman named Alan Mulally. He's a director of Google. He built Boeing 777. He had 186 people come every Thursday. There was single, no flaw in building 777. He was recruited to be CEO of Ford 2007, and he turned the company around. He had that every Thursday, the whole team, 24 coming in. I've been to that. I used to work there as a consultant all the round table, 24 people. And they all came every Thursday. Those they didn't want to come, they were not there. Only one person left. With the same team, he built that company. So conducting the team dialogue is the very critical skill. People are not trained in it. No, and I think that, you know, in some cases you have individual contributors who are, 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 really, are really good. And it doesn't mean they're going to be great leaders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. And you yeah. kind of have to learn, you know, how to, how to do that. Yeah. Um, and so we've got yeah. a couple questions coming in from the audience. Yes, uh, please. Yeah. The, the first one is uh, from Steve uh, Sager. He said, who should be the DRI for talent acquisition? Excellent question. Now, the number one, the, if your company is going to need a large number of customers for no a large number of, of talent acquisition today, I want first thing that person to report to the CEO. Direct. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. You can use the CHRO to help you, but the person who's going to recruiting is a different person in most cases than the CHRO. Most CHROs are not really done a lot of recruiting in their lives. They do a broader job. So I have in the world's largest companies have the recruiter, the whole system, not just recruiter, 
report him to CEO. You do that for raw materials. You're right now dealing with supply chains, your personal attention. Why not people? And today, talent shortage, you know that, that people leaving and all that. So if it is critical for your job, you get the right person who knows how to do it, have the system to it, report to you. So I want to give you an example. There is a privately held company called CDR, Clayton de Villiers Rice. Jack Welch became the operating partner. And with him was Alan Lefley, CEO of Procter & Gamble. It also happened to CEO of Boeing, three of us. One of his jobs was to review companies CDR has in the portfolio. And so you have to know Jack Welch, you know, I was with him for 23 years. And people need to know this man was absolutely meticulous in doing his homework. He may not show you, but don't fool yourself. And so he, companies will come and make their presentation. He will review, coach them. And there will be a gallery of people sitting outside there watching because they learn how to do the reviews. So in this particular case, I was told I was not there by one of the people present. So this gentleman came with his team. He's going to make a presentation in the review. He's going to get coaching. So Jack has a habit of first three, four minutes talking nonsense. How's the weather? How's the, the this baseball team, some other teams, soften people up? And then he says, let me hear. So the gentleman began to, to present the slides, and Jack, Jack said, I have read it. I don't need the slides. Tell me what's the most critical thing preventing your growth. He said, service. Okay, draw the organization chart. He does. Where is the service person? Three levels below you. Why isn't he reporting to you? Sometimes it's those things, right, where you just, um, the line of sight is disconnected. And, and I, I'm not making an assumption you've ever watched the television show Undercover Boss, but it's a perfect example. Okay, there you go. You know, no, of, it, when, it, of when yeah. leaders just aren't close enough to the people. Yeah, no, his case was twofold. One reporting to you, second one was the quality of person at the third level below you is lower. Yeah. And the pay is lower. And the ability for him to work or her is lower. When reporting to you next door to you is your critical element. The whole company sees that. Right. Right. So All I right. have a very large company in India. I've just done that. And this person, who's a very, very rich man, got my advice. And he just recruited one, reporting directly to him. And dotted line to the HR person. He said, there are no dotted lines. You work with me, travel with me, see with me, you go and get it. Well, you know, this is almost a rhetorical question, but I love it. Uh, it's from a, a, one of our listeners. And, and the <coughs> question is, what do your client CEOs say is your superpower, Ram? <laughs> what is your What's superpower? Question, what, are you? what is your superpower? What do people think you are really, really good at? No, no. You see what I try. I try to learn what is their pain problem and try to solve it or say I cannot solve it. I don't go there, I have a solution, take it. In most cases, I don't have a solution. So I would, I would almost then say maybe one of your superpowers, right? The things you do really well may be asking the right questions I do. And, and and intently listening. Yeah, no question that give me this feedback. The other part is I am a closed mouth. And that is the reason I don't have a company. See, people came to me to write the book on GE. The writers came to me and said, but my book will be incomplete without you giving me an hour of interview. I said, I will not do that. Because I know the secrets. I went to the board meetings of very critical nature for 12 years in GE. I will not do that. Well, Somebody I think to me, read my manuscript and point out the inconsistencies. I will not do that. Well, I think that there is a high level of trust, you know, having been an external advisor for a decade, um, your reputation is everything. And, and very key. And if you 
hear things. You can anonymize things like you say, you know, I deal with a lot of companies in one situation, this happened in one situation that happened and you don't have to use the name and there's no, no, no reason. I, no, yeah. I don't do that. In yeah. my books, I have disguised companies or otherwise I have written clearance from the companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's no need. So I know that you've got, um, you know, in the, the last few minutes that we have uh, together, although I could talk to you all day, no question, um, is you are right in the middle and have just pushed out content around the topic of inflation. And I right. know it's near and dear to you. So I want to make sure that we talk about sort of how businesses are responding to what is happening in the current environment. Okay. So number one large number of people in the companies today have not yet woken up and they're going to pay a major penalty. Number two, those who have woken up, they're taking large price increases and they're ahead of the curve. Why everybody should know in the audience that there are universal things about inflation. One, inflation takes more cash for the same volume. Number two, Inflation rolls down the street. I increase price. Next person will increase more price. So if you are supplying a merchandise, it goes to PNG, they will increase price. It goes to somebody else, increase price. So that's how you create hyperinflation. Psychology creates cycle. Number three, every company must start right away to find the cash traps. They are in account receivables and in the inventories. And people cannot pay, will not want to pay in time. You may have contracts that are fixed contracts. You've got to take waste out of decision making and waste out of the company. This is a good time to take waste out. There's a lot of waste in every company, regardless of anything. Most importantly, your trust with the customer. In 1970s, we had that problem, stagflation, only 80s. So you don't take a chocolate bar cut in two thirds and set the same price. You will lose the trust. It will be hard to come back. Face it head on. And then you say that what does the CFO do? What does the operations person do? What the legal person do? It's everybody's business that customer one first and second cash. When you run a business cash. Now, one thing you got to watch if you are a CFO, or a board member. Do not trust the numbers on gap accounting basis. Have your company make the numbers on a cash basis. By the way, Jeff Bezos from day one managed Amazon on a cash basis. He would show losses, but a solid company with positive cash. Within the four years, he began to have positive cash. He's got a ton of load of cash. So these are the universal things it's in my articles in the Fortune, in Chief Executive Magazine. Chief Executive Magazine has nine pages to give you all the hooks what you need to work on. Now, people hold things that create more inflation going forward. Yes, I am predicting. Predicting always a, is the wrong thing to do. This inflation will last minimum three years. Minimum. No matter what Fed does. And 2024 only, I would expect a recession. They have to bring a recession. There's no simple way. This well, inflation is different from the 70s because of the shortage of supplies, because of US, China, and Russia tensions. It is it is has a a very different kind of inflation. Well, I, I am in no position to debate you on 2024 or 2025 of when that might happen. But, um, you know, thank you for sharing your thoughts there and also, you know, recommending where people can learn more. Uh, I've got a couple last questions for you, if you're still willing. Mm -hmm. yes, um, one is, are CEOs uh, taking sustainability, the sustainability agenda seriously? Yeah. So I serve on several boards, Canada, United States. I advise several companies in Japan. It is very serious. On my boards, I chair the, uh, I, I, I participate in the committee. In another one, I chair the committee. We have action plans laid out. 
We know the process. We have incentives laid out. We do it quarterly. People are taken very seriously. Those who don't, they're going to suffer later because the marketplace will reduce your price earning ratio. The second point, and I will name the company. One, I will disguise it when I name it. They figured out how to get very good return on investment in sustainability. And that is Pepsi. I have won a $10 billion company in Asia. They're going to put half a billion dollars in the next four years. They have done all the calculations. It will earn more than cost of capital. Walmart did several years ago under the previous CEO, demonstrated you do sustainability in your truck fleet and you make a ton of money. He did very clear demonstration. So it's serious. It, it will create market value for you, but you need to get the right people to do it. All right. And then the last question, which I think is a fantastic way to end this, having written 33 books and not that we need to go through all 33, but if you were to say the three people should read in what order, what would you say? If you want to learn about business acumen, whether you're a starter or a CEO, pick up my book, What CEO Wants You to Know. It describes the one-man businessman, which is the street vendor. It describes a Jack Welch running a complex GE. Would you believe they use exactly the same terminology across the world? Exactly the same. So you learn because you cannot be a good CEO without business savvy, which is separate from leadership. You can be a street vendor with good business savvy, but not a leader. All right, that's the first one. What's the second one? Second is execution. Of course. You third? Go yeah. The third one I really want you to, to think about is the Rethinking competitive advantage. Now, I do want to add the fourth one, and that is the leadership pipeline. Half a million copies. It's used by most, and we're going to revise it for the digital age. There you have it. From the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Ram Sharan, giving you advice on what books to read in what order? What does the CEO want you to know? Execution, building competitive advantage, and uh, leadership. What was the fourth one? Pipeline. Leadership pipeline. pipeline. Leadership pipeline. pipeline. Those yes. four. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, I know there are so many more questions that we've got, but I want to be respectful of your time. I thank you so much, sir, for honoring me with your presence uh, on the What's Next podcast. I hope all of you enjoyed this conversation with Ram Sharan. Please go pick up his latest book, Talent, um, and then read one of the other 33 or all 33 of them, whatever uh, is best for you. But I want to thank you once again uh, for joining me here today, Ram, on the What's Next podcast. Tiffany, it's a great honor for me, and I thank you for your very incisive questions. Thank you again. Have a, have a wonderful life. Anything I can do, call me. Thank you. Thank you so much.